I was probably about eight years old the first time my parents got me my first computer. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have seen these things, but they're awesome. Um, I loved it. I, I was like eight bits of processing. It was fantastic. And you take this thing, you plug it into your, your TV, and you like push buttons, and something would change on the TV if you were lucky. Um, and sometimes you had to put in a cassette tape, and you had to play it off. And if you did it just right, then it would make little beeping noises. To me, it was like magic. It was like I'd never seen before kind of magic. Now, my parents were the kind of like wise people who like encouraged my fascination with magic. And they actually sent me to a class. And I got to learn to become a magician. It was a programming class. And I realized that this was an awesome thing I wanted to do. And everywhere I looked around me, I found that there were magical things in the world. There were machines that, you know, created by magicians. Like nowadays, they often call them things like, you know, engineers or scientists. But to me, I wanted to be the magician. And I actually love that title. You can call me myself for a magician if you want to. Um, my particular area of interest has always been how do I make machines work well with us? So it's actually an area that we often call artificial intelligence, which says, how do I make machines smart? Now, for the last five years or so, I've been working at the Idaho National Lab, and we've been working on, is this still working? Um, we've been working on robots, and how do we make them useful? And I've taken robots into some fascinating areas. I've used them to map buildings. I've taken them to find explosives. I've helped them to find um, what you might, they can't hear in the back, you may want to turn it up. Where you want to be able to find landmines. I've actually taken a robot to Fukushima after the Japanese um, meltdown of the nuclear reactor. What I've found is, whenever we start talking about robots and intelligence, is I usually bring in these middle you know, school kids, and uh, the first thing I hear is, are you crazy? Have you not heard about Terminator? Um, what about iRobot? I saw that. I, I saw The Matrix once, and I'm telling you there is going to be a robot revolution, and what are you thinking about doing this? I've actually had kids, yeah, crying of, you know, please don't, please. So I tell them usually one of three things. First of all, if you're going to have a robot revolution, you might as well be on the winning side, right? <laughs> so if I'm going to have robots having problems, I'm going to be the one that they're going to be like, oh, yeah, he's my buddy. Um, my name means winner. You just got to have that right down the foundation. You're going to be on the good side. And the second thing is, you don't have a lot to worry about for a while. Um, I have a lot of robots and some of the smartest robots in the world, and they are completely befuddled by a closed door. Um, they really just don't have anywhere to go. You can flood them. You can, there's really not much you can do. They're, they're smartest robots because it doesn't run into the wall. It's a really low grade for intelligence. We've got a ways to go. The third thing is, that's really not the point. Our goal isn't necessarily to make something that is human replacement. Our goal is to make something that is a human partner. What we want to have in our machines is to find a way for us to make something that works well with us, that will enhance our natural abilities. So for me, this is maybe my lifeline goal. I want to make a, I'm going to call him FIP. It is for friendly, interactive, pretend human. Um, a partner that we want to have with us, that we're going to be able to say, this is my machine to help me do what I want to do well. Now, this journey of making a FIP is actually a very interesting journey for me. Because what I have to do is I have to look at humanity through the eyes of a robot. How do I prepare and code and help this robot understand what you and I are? Because that's the goal, right? I want to be able to make something that interacts well with you. That's not an easy job, because I have to interact with me all the time, and it doesn't really work that well. Um, I have to have it understand what it means to be human so that it can be an assistant to a human. Let me give you some examples. To understand the human brain, we have to look a little bit closer at the way we work, right? One of the things we do is to understand what's the makeup of our brain. What does it take to grow and think through all the different pieces with it? Um, it it's pretty common that we say that you can store about five things in your brain, right? Five things in what I'll call your working knowledge. If I give you a random set of numbers, um, I gave you too many. Um, 
if you could have between, they say, five and seven, if you could store these things in your brain, you could be able to say, okay, if I asked you a minute, what was the third one or what's the first one, you uh, think about it for a while, you could do it. But if I keep adding numbers, your chances are you're starting to gloss over, you really don't care anymore, and you've pretty much given up. We've talked a little bit about the way that we've, we train ourselves in that. However, if we went the other way and I tried to perhaps sing you a song, I'm not going to sing you a song because my wife would mock me forever. If I give you just like one or two pieces of a song, like, um, da 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 da, do you know what the rest of the song is? It's a pretty good chance you just pulled in the entire Star Wars theme if I did it right. Um, and you've got the whole thing. You can actually play it front and back in your mind. And if we even said, now that I've mentioned Star Wars theme, you could probably jump in and see Darth Vader entering into the thing and jump ahead right to the point where you see Luke walk, walking in and seeing the burning house and jump ahead seeing Millennium Falcon taking off and then jump all the way to the end and see the thing blowing up and then jump back and see Darth Vader and Obi-Wan having a fight. All those things are in your working memory immediately. So instead of having just four pieces of memory, you've got hundreds of pieces of information all being played in and out in your memory. Because our brains are created to store things like songs and related things and stories in our memory. We store that, things that way. Well, isn't it interesting that when we get to the, um, to the world of robots, we don't normally deal with things that way. We heard, heard a little bit a while ago about how in school we put in a specific rigid regiment. Isn't it interesting that we often, in school, test people on recall? That's how we measure intelligence. We say things like, please tell us the number of Chinese you know, emperors from here or there. What's the, the equations for um, the area of a circle? What's the four times three? All these things are recall based. And yet we're not designed for that. We're designed for story based. Computers have been designed very well now to do recall fantastically. If you put any of those numbers into a computer, instantly you're going to get it back. And yet we don't consider them intelligent. So for us, we need to have the ability for us to connect that kind of recall into the ability of what we store well, which is the stories. So our FIP machine, what we want it to be able to do is to be able to augment our ability to understand stories and be able to communicate with us in a story way and still be able to give us the kind of recall ability we want to be able to do. Now beyond that, we also want our machines to understand us because they have certain goals, right? I want this machine to be able to do good things. I want it to understand how I think because I want it to be able to help me do what I want to get done. I want it to be able to communicate well with me. I want it to understand what I'm thinking. And I want it to be able to convince me of the right things. Or in my case, I want it to convince you. What if what you're doing is wrong and we need it to tell you what's real? This is the foundation of what it really means in artificial intelligence to help us understand humanity. Now, our poor machine has a hard time of this. Because as you can imagine, we've been trying to figure out how we think for thousands of years. Um, this morning, my wife several times mentioned, what were you thinking? Um, and I don't have a good answer. <laughs> but the more we investigate, the more we look at what it takes for us to be understood and communicated with, the more we can understand each other and understand the things. For instance, I believe that there is a process that we go through when we process the world around us. And it is very much based upon those same stories. Our brain holds those stories and we use it to process things. So everything we do, every person we see, we bring through a framework. We bring it through our filter of what we do. We get inputs from our experience, ideas that are presented to us, and we filter all those things and store them in our brain and then we create actions that go out the back end. This is a very important process. It is the essence of what we do. And every person does this in a very unique manner. It is unique to me. It's unique to you. And I believe these are filled with stories. Now, I believe these stories are created and stored in two ways. Because I'm a computer scientist, I have to have codes for everything. This is the way I believe fit represents or understands humanity. I believe we store these in what I will call conclusionaries and predictionaries. Conclusionaries are things that conclusions we've made, like the sky is blue, um, I'm tall, I'm good looking, um, this talk is fascinating. All of these kinds of things 
attached to, to narratives. There are things why these are important. We have stories to connect it. Sky is blue because my mom told me to when I was two. And she pointed that color and said, that's blue. And I experienced that. This talk is fascinating because the bees made 20 mistakes already and I can't take my eyes off that. <laughs> On the other side, we can also do the other way across. So we have our conclusions and our becauses and our narratives. But the other way we come in, if we have a narrative, then we have a therefore and a conclusion. So I had this story, they did this thing, this girl looked at me, she smiled, therefore, she's cute. That's all it takes. On the other hand, <laughs> predictionaries are the other side. They say, I have a set of conclusions to what I've got, therefore, this is what I predict the world will look like. I believe this is the way we often process the world. We have to have millions and millions of these conclusionaries and predictionaries that we use to make our choices. We use them to filter everything we've seen, and we use them to filter everything we want to do. Now, these are extremely interconnected. There's millions of them. To try and recreate this is way beyond what we can do today. But to even understand it is important for you and I to understand each other, even. It's not just the job of a robot to understand us. There's a lot that goes through this. These are living. And because they're so interconnected, we tend to do things what we'll call group them into things like frames, where I'll take anything that's interconnected, things like everything to do with my religion, everything to do with people, everything to do with people who are short, everything to do with people who are from Italy, everything to do with people who are my friends. And we group all those together, and we put them into little frames, and then we use those to be able to simplify our lives. We do them things like stereotypes to be able to help us create habits. All these things are important, but what's really important is to understand how they change. A couple of years ago, we had Dr. Um, Jeff Bradshaw visit us, and he showed this picture to us at the lab, and I really liked it, so I changed it. Um, <laughs> this is a way that you can think about how we interpret the world. I believe that every time something happens, it comes in to the top through either an experience or even though it's an experience, someone else's experience. They'll tell us something. I stand up in front of you and I say something, and I often present to you a narrative, or I present to you my, your conclusionaries, and what you have to do is filter this. Everything you see, everything you do, you filter. And the first way I believe we do this is we look and say, is there something in my framework that fits? Have I already got a conclusionary that fits? And if I do, I pat myself on the back and I put that in there and say, yep, I'm right. Now, unfortunately, this is a problem because even if that's not a good conclusion, that's what we look for. We look at the world through our conclusions. We start with, I'm fat. And I look around me and I say, yep, 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 all the proof. Nobody likes me. That's, you know, nobody likes me, that's the proof. Look at all the evidence I've got that I, I'm not liked. And that becomes our conclusion. All we do is continually support our narratives because we've got that conclusion. Sometimes that's great. We can continue. The sky's still blue today. The sky's still blue tomorrow. That's still blue. Sometimes it's wrong. Like if we're reinforcing negative effects on us, it's really hard. So the other side is extremely important to us, and that's what do we do with new information? If I have a new narrative that comes in, do I trust it? If someone comes up and says, I had a pink elephant in my living room, do I say, yes, okay, now pink elephants live in living rooms, or do I file away, yep, that guy's crazy? Um, we store everything, whether we store it as a new conclusion or we store it as this doesn't apply, or I may ignore it, because if it goes against my framework, sometimes I don't want to deal with it. Sometimes we create new ones. The process of that is fascinating, and it's something that will, will take millions of years for us to understand, I believe. But each one of us takes all of our other conclusions, find new ways to make, build on those and create new conclusions. And sometimes we get to the point where we have so much new information that there's a conflict, and we have to do something. We have to change our conclusions. We have to create something new. That's an important process. Sometimes it's easy. This talk is no longer interesting. Um, sometimes it's hard. How do I define myself? If I have very highly connected frames that I'm asking you to change, it often creates a crisis. Um, we call these things the midlife crisis. We call them faith crisis. We call them puberty. All these things are important to help us define who we are and what we become. But they are our most fundamental part of who we are. Now, interestingly enough, I can imagine our FIP robot looking at us saying, boy, that guy's stubborn. Um, our tendency to either support somebody else's 
um, information and make framework changes very quickly. If I don't change very often, I'm considered stubborn or faithful or loyal. If I change a whole bunch, I am wishy-washy, weird. You know, I just keep, you know, I keep doing things around. I might be misunderstood because, frankly, we each have the same narrative, but we're each filtering them through a different set of world frameworks. When we come out, we're going to have different conclusions. When I have my robot speak to you, I don't want it to just give you the narrative. I need it to give you the narrative with the conclusion so you understand what it was thinking and why it's there. It's most powerful for us to speak in words that are, um, we'll call story-based, conclusionaries, predictionaries. Eventually, I think we may get to the point where our little robot could actually start questioning those things itself. What stories do we want to tell our robots? What stories do we build into our machines? They're everywhere. Everything you do with your machine, you have a context for it. And what we learn about ourselves is probably just as applicable by what stories we tell our machines. How are we using them? Um, some of the most fundamental parts of us is to understand why we are here, why we were created. Whether we were created from, from process, whether we were created for a purpose, and what that purpose was. Was it for the purpose of the creator's value? Was it for our value? What is our purpose in creating our machines? And what does that tell us about us? In reality, our goal is to have a single mind, to have a single story, that when I have my machine work with humanity, we work together as a team, that we have the same stories, we have the same narratives, the same conclusionaries, the same predictionaries, and ultimately, we want to be able to reach forward to something great. I don't know what the future holds, but I do believe that the more we use, the more stories we build inside of each other, perhaps the greatest mystery of all is the mystery inside of us, understanding humanity. Perhaps the greatest reason we take machines is because the machines will teach us about who we are. And I hope it's a great journey. Thank you.